Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. Today's topic are cell complexes, um, or rather how you can construct certain nice topological spaces using disks, using cells. So disks and cells will be kind of the same in this talk. Um, and I really would like to stress that these are nice topological spaces because in the end for those spaces, it will be easy to compute or relatively easy to compute the invariance we like to construct or we are interested in from the viewpoint of algebraic topology. And spaces that are not cell complexes are usually pretty ill-behaved, which isn't necessarily some, something bad. You might say, okay, then they are very interesting. I will show you an example later, um, but certainly they are harder. So I kind of want to ignore them and I kind of want to look at cell complexes. Strictly speaking, in the end, I will actually look at some kind of what, what people would maybe call a finite dimensional cell complex or a finite cell complex or imposing some finiteness conditions um, because I really would like to think of those examples. So I want to go from polygons to donuts. So how does it work? Well, there's a standard construction how to construct a donut and the donut is of course just the torus. Uh, and it works as follows. You just take a sheet of paper and you glue together those ends and you glue together those ends as illustrated here, B and A, B and A, and then you're done. Um, yeah, so then you create a torus, right? You, you just uh, you know, wrap it around and you have created a torus. You can actually try that in practice. So if you have a sheet of paper, I, I wouldn't recommend to use a square paper to do it in, uh, in real life, but, but rather already a, a longish strand because it's, it's pretty hard to do from the, from a square. But anyway, in topology, we don't care about those uh, issues and you definitely just can't, can construct the torus just from the square. And what I would like to stress is I can construct the square basically um, by using the following. I could construct the square. Well, I don't, I don't, well, let, let's ignore orientations. By using a lot of one cells, uh, so a lot of one dimensional objects, which I would call one cells, uh, actually four of them, and zero dimensional objects, which I will call zero cells, also four of them, for example, you could use a different number, but, and then you would glue them together in a very nice way. And you glue in the middle, you would glue a two dimensional space, which is a two cell. That's what I would like to think. So let me, let me say it again. I take my piece of, of paper, I kind of strap it down dimension by dimension into one dimensional pieces, which I call one cells into zero dimensional pieces, which I call zero cells and into a middle two dimensional piece, which I call a two cell. Huh? And I glue them together in a specific way and I obtain my torus or I would obtain just what I told you, my square, uh, both. And the gluing procedure, the precise gluing distinguishes them in the end. And anyway, both are examples of CW complexes or cell complexes. Um, and so are all of these. Uh, so you can construct the double torus, which is this space by doing exactly the same procedure, but using uh, an eight gun, or you can construct a triple torus. Here's an illustration how it works by gluing together the corresponding edges. So you glue together E to the other E edge, um, F to the other F edge and so on. And this is kind of the procedure I would like to generalize or people generalized in this notion of constructing the notion of a cell complex or alternatively it's sometimes called CW complex. Um, so I, I'm, I'd rather go with cell complex, uh, but I, I can't promise that I will always say cell complex because I personally learned it under the name CW complex and it's just too very hard to change your habits. My apologies. Anyway, whether you call it cell complex or CW complex, it doesn't matter. It's a generalization of this process. And yeah, so, so let me show you how to construct a sphere. Um, so this was the torus, the double torus, the triple torus, uh, the four hole torus. So how to construct a zero hole torus, another way where it's the sphere. Well, there are two ways of doing it. Maybe the bottom one is easier. Um, I just 
put one of my zero cells, one of my zero dimensional objects. This is just a zero cell, it's just a D zero disk of dimension zero at the point. I just put one disk of dimension zero. I decided to not put any disks of dimension one. A disk of dimension one is a line. I don't want to put any of them or a line with two boundary points, so an interval. But I take a disk of dimension two and the disk of dimension two is, uh, well, no, not, not this one, is this one, of course. And I just take the boundary of my disk and I just punch it all the way to the, to the point, right? It, it's like creating a balloon. You have a balloon actually is nothing else than a D2 and then you uh, pinpoint it together at a point and you have a, a sphere if you fill it with air, right? So that's exactly this construction down here. There is one zero cell and there's a big two cell. And I just constructed uh, the sphere for you using what it will be called as cell structure. I could do differently. I could use the construction upstairs here, which uses one, two, three, four, one cells, uh, zero cells. They are connected by one cells. I told you these are uh, something like this. And you could construct this skeleton of a, of a tetrahedron. And then you glue in those two cells, one, two, one in the back, one in the, one, uh, uh, well, one at the bottom. So you would construct four. So what do we have here in this construction? We have four zero cells. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, one cells. And we have uh, this one here. Uh, there's one in the front, there's one in the back, and there's one here. So we have four, two cells. And here we just have uh, one, zero, one. So if you know what the Euler characteristic is and you would now take alternating sums, you would see that both are actually two, which is the Euler characteristic of the sphere. We're just taking the alternating sums. One minus zero plus one, four minus six plus four. But anyway, the point is I just uh, showed you two different cell structures on the, on the sphere itself. Um, but the idea of how to construct them is actually the same. Just you add a number of points, you add a number of lines, you add a number of uh, uh, disks, you add a number of three disks and so on, and you glue them together along the boundary, right? So let me show you more examples. So this is really how it works. You add zero cells, which is just, you add points. Here's a point, here's a point, here's a point. In this case, I just have one of them. And you add two cells, uh, sorry, one cells. And the one cell is, as I said, just, a D1, which is an interval, a disk. A one dimensional disk is an interval. And well, you can either add zero or nothing, or you can add them like on this side, you can add them like this, right? You glue those two boundary points here, this boundary point and this boundary point, you glue them both to the, um, uh, to, to the one existing uh, a zero cell. So that's the procedure. You take your boundary points or your boundary and glue it to the existing. And then you glue in the next number, next higher structure, the two cell uh, in this example that I had before, so this one here, um, I still have my boundary point. I decided to put no one cells and I now take my disc and I take the boundary of the disc, as I said, and just glue everything just on this point and I get this balloon-like balloon picture. Or I can do something like this. Um, from here, I can go to here, or from here, I can go to the torus, something like that. There's a lot of freedom what you can do. Um, it all depends on basically in each step, you choose uh, how many disks of the corresponding dimension you want to glue and how you want to glue them to the already existing part. And this is then what gives you the notion of a, well, either a cell complex or a CW complex, depends. So a cell complex is constructed inductively by exactly what I said. Start with a discrete set of points, uh, assume that the so-called N skeleton, so N minus N minus one skeleton, so those are called the skeletons, are already constructed, and then you attach N cells. 
by, by a certain gluing map and you um, impose this quotient under this gluing. And there's a certain way of doing a topology on this. It's called the weak topology. Right? A subset is closed if and only if it meets the closure in, in each cell in, the, uh, in a closed set. So it's defined cell-wise, piece-wise. And the nice thing is now you have this funny cell filtration and each skeleton itself is a relatively easy um, object, namely some, something, something like this, right? Something like this. So uh, for example, uh, standard examples of one dimensional CW complexes are just graphs, right? You, you graphs are just connection, collection of points, boop, 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 something like that. I don't know what a graph is. This, for example, and you glue, well, edges to the graph by just identifying um, the, what vertex, we could do this one, uh, what vertex is the start of the end of an edge, right? And yeah, in practice, um, you would actually impose real, a lot of finiteness conditions. So Hatcher is a bit more precise as usual. Hatcher is linked in the description below. Um, and well, this would be a, whatever, a finite CV, CW complex. Some CW complexes might not be finite. For example, a, a, an obvious one would be uh, you could impose to have finite, that you only glue finitely many cells per step or that you stop at a finite number of steps, something like that. So you might want to make this notion a little bit nicer, but really the cool fact is that locally, actually those things are pretty easy. They're kind of glued together from disks, right? From the ends and the ends, we understand the ends and everything subtly then depends on how you glue things together. But in some sense, you can still say something about them in particular, look, you can uh, compute those topological invariants we're interested in, in a reasonable way. Just a warning, uh, I, I already say it here. So um, there might be many CW, uh, different structures. So here I showed you two. They're not equivalent as cell structures. They are different cells, but they give you the same topological space. And that's in the end what we are interested in. Um, but you might be really unlucky and your favorite topological space might not have any cell structure at all. And the cell structure is, uh, just just this datum here, right? And just the standard example are the Hyverian earrings, <laughs> which is kind of this funny construction that you just take a point, you glue to it a circle, you glue to it a circle, you glue to it a circle, and you glue to it a circle, and so on. So on this side, you have an illustration up to infinity, and you impose on it uh, the topology of R2 coming from the embedding. And this is kind of really crucial because this makes this space different from just an abstract space with infinitely many circles glued together. And actually you can show um, that this space doesn't admit uh, a cell structure. And most of the things you like to compute are, are a bit crazy. So I was pretty shocked when I learned about the fundamental group of this example. It, it looks pretty easy. I mean, it's a, it, it is, it seems to be a not very complicated space, but this point here at the bottom, of course, is really ill-behaved because any every neighborhood of that point, so here's a neighborhood, uh, it has finitely many open arcs uh, corresponding to the circles you cut out, but it still has infinitely many circles. So you only cut out of a finite piece, any neighborhood, no matter how small you make it, and you will always have an infinite piece left. And that makes it very, very ill-behaved. So there's a very nice discussion linked in the description below uh, how actually weird the fundamental group of this space is in contrast to the fundamental group of something like an infinite batch of circles. And the, the, the problem is, of course, um, with this topology that you impose here, which makes the space actually nice. So a CW complex actually nice, although um, it might, might be infinite. This space is really badly behaved. It's a standard counterexample in topology that you see all the time. And well, for example, the fundamental group uh, description, uh, the link is in the description, is actually not countably generated anymore, which is already pretty weird. There's read relations and so on and so on. Um, yeah, so um, left aside that standard counterexample in topology, uh, most nice topological spaces are 
CW complexes, cell complexes, they have a cell structure. So you want to have a nice cell structure. And the cell structure helps you to compute the various invariants you see in, um, in algebraic topology. So that's why people like to study cell complexes. And in the end, cell complexes, as I tried to explain, up to some nasty details, are just exactly uh, how you build a donut from, from, from a square or a two-sided uh, two donut, um, a double donut, donut um, from an eight con, as I explained before. Anyway, I hope you liked the video and I also hope to see you next time.